Will this be the driest and most technical lecture on the history of the English language in this entire course? It'll be in the top 10%, but if you get through it with me, we'll, do, we'll, we'll give you, we'll, have, we'll do a little, little English poetry at the end to make it fun. We'll treat for you all. I know I have a weird idea of what a treat is. Let's look at this image here. This image is um, from the 14th century uh, poem, The Pearl, by the same author as Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Here, the dreamer is having a dream vision where he's looking across a river into the afterlife where his da dead daughter is appearing to him from paradise, telling him all about the heavenly Jerusalem and stuff like that. And they're having a big old conversation about heaven and God and salvation and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, uh, let's see what else. Um, Middle English uh, is, and we've talked about the slider that languages have between synthetic on the one side and analytic on the other, where the function of words is entirely determined by their endings and by their combinations with sounds and morphemes on the one hand, and on the other hand, where it's entirely determined by word order, right? Um, in Middle English, that slider is going to move increasingly towards analytic, increasingly towards word order being determining meanings and that new kinds of words uh, being used to pair up with other words to indicate what they're doing in the sentence rather than the word itself changing. An example of this is the way that um, in Old English you have a dative case, which is used for the indirect object. So I give him, uh, Hick, H-E-C, uh, uh, -E uh, an item, right? I give he Heck an item. Uh, but in, um, in Middle English and on, you'd say, I give the item to him. Now, we can still indicate by context and position that it's an indirect object, especially with pronouns, but um, my point remains. Uh, in Middle English, we get the increased use of articles, which are almost not used at all in Old English. We have demonstratives. So if I say like, sa-wig, uh, the warrior in Old English, if I say sa-wig, it doesn't just mean the warrior. It means like this warrior. It's really emphasizing that it's this one. <clears throat> Whereas the, the, the demonstrative force of that weakens until it just becomes an article indicating um, uh, a specific one or an unspecific one the or a. Uh. Interestingly, the indeterminate article in English, a, uh, comes from the Old English um, word for one, which was an or ana, a-n. Remember in the last last time, uh, in the last video or this video on sound changes, we talked about how the sound a uh, becomes, lowers down to o in from um, as Old English goes into Middle English, so that must becomes most, while an for one becomes ona, uh, or one, O-N-E, it was spelled that way because there's no W in it. Back in the old days, it was pronounced on or ona. Um, and, and only is actually related to that. Onely, <laughs> only, I am, I, I, he, on, only I am doing it. Onely, I am doing it, right? So A is actually a short form of the word one. It's like one day, on a day. All right. Another thing that we get in Middle English is an increase is the comparative more and the superlative most. Rather than endings, bigger, biggest, um, we get the combination of more and most, uh, which is similar to in French. We have le plus, le mieux um, uh, used. And so maybe it's by analogy to French. Often in modern words, in modern English, the words that don't, um, that we, we don't allow um, adjective, uh, sorry, comparative and superlative endings like er and ist, which have a Germanic background where we have to say um, uh, more or most, like beautiful, for example. You can't, you, we don't say beautifuler and beautifulest. We say more beautiful and most beautiful. And a lot, it's funnily enough, a lot of the words that we have to do more and most with come from French or Latin or Romance and not from the native Germanic stock of the English language. So we get a stricter word order um, we can't sort of move things around like you do in Old English more. We also get an increase in auxiliaries, uh, auxiliary verbs, helper verbs, as you might have uh, been taught. They were called in um, grammar school or in, you know, in elementary school or middle school, like have or will, right? Those are, those are tense modals. Um, will actually is early modern for the future. Should or may, modal auxiliaries that change the mood. We get uh, decreasing use of the subjunctive verb um, 
which in the subjunctive verb indicates something that's sort of doubtful or notional or possible rather than something that is happening. Um, we get more and more pleonastic subject pronouns. I love the word pleonastic so much. Um, it technically means a redundancy. Uh, it's from Greek. Um, but we also call these dummy subjects. Like, um, there is a problem, right? That there doesn't refer to anything. It's not talking about, like, there in that place. You know, it is raining. It is not talking about the sky, right? These are dummy subjects. And, like, you know, instead of saying there is a problem, in Old English, you could just say is a problem. Um, uh, and, and other languages that can drop pronouns um, will do that. You know, in Spanish, hay problema, right? You don't have to, there's no, you, Spanish can drop pronouns. You don't have to have a subject pronoun in Spanish. So you can just say, is a problem, right? Um, English gets increasingly, Old English, you can drop uh, subject pronouns. Middle English, that goes away. Um, the other thing that we see a rise in is sentence connectors. Complementer, in, in, in big linguistic terms, are called complementizers and relativizers. That, how, for, until, whether, all things that link one sentence to another. I know that you are cool. I know how you are cool. Um, I have known this a long time. For, you have been cool to me for a long time. I will continue to be your friend until you stop being cool, which will be never. Which will be never. Um, and, hey, you know what? I would like you, whether you are cool or not, right? All of these connect two different sentences, and we get more of these these connecting words. Whereas in Old English, you had very few. You had like tha and thana. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit more about word order. In Early Middle English, you get an increasing um, uh, frequency of st specific word orders. You get SVO, subject, verb, object, I see the whale, more often. Um, but also, Especially in early Middle English, there's you commonly see subject, object, verb wor word order. I, the whale, see. Um, this is the standard word order in Latin. Um, uh, also, in Old English, you, you would get um, uh, the verb in the second position, and this survives in um, Middle English. This year for the king, Stefano oversat Normandy. This year went for, he went forth, the king, Stephen, Oversee to Normandy, right? This year went the King Stephen. Um, and so this is a common uh, form for introducing, especially new statements or stories or narratives in Middle English. Um, in Modern English, we don't often see subject, object, verb, but we do in Middle English. Later in Middle English, we only see it in um, subordinate clauses, which is also the case in modern German. You have the subject, you have SVO in main clauses and SOV in subordinate clauses. I know my grammar nerds out there right now are loving this and some of your, you, your eyes are crossing. You're doing great. Keep up. We got you here. And we can learn more about this in Van Gelderen's History of the English Language, page 133. Uh, he hadn't him manred, maked, and athis sworn. They had to him homage done and oaths sworn. Subject, they, uh, ob uh, object, homage and oaths, um, verb, done and sworn. All right, later developments in Middle English. We get a noun adjective order in noun phrases sometimes that indicate French influences. For example, in other places, delitables, delightful places, right? But places, delightfuls, right? Um, and this is really the heavy influence of French here that hasn't been fully kind of digested into English yet. Um, we have a few examples in English, again, of um, the um, uh, uh, very few examples of this noun adjective uh, word order um, for particularly for, from legal Latin or for government positions like attorney general. Right. Attorney is the noun. General is the adjective. Uh, Weather is um, used to introduce yes, no questions. It's very, very peculiar. Uh, so, um, you know, yeah. Uh, the, and we see the emergence in later Middle English of obligatory subject pronouns. Always talk, already talked about that. Compound past with have, I have seen, I have done. Modal auxiliaries may and might. 
If I see oft Micht have a wedded beast is the wife of Bath in her prologue. Um, if I say often, I might have wedded been. We also get the emergence and the increasing use of the infinitive marker too. Um, Old English has an inflected infinitive. Um, that is like in Spanish, hablar, to speak. There's an inflection in hablar that makes it an infinitive. And in Old English, you had like, uh, you know, spekenda, spekenda, I should say, spechana, spechana, I'm not sure. But there's this enna or anna ending, which was an infinitive ending. And you get that um, first in combination with the um, preposition to, to spekenda, and then finally the the infinitive uh, ending drops off and it's just to speak. Uh, and also when replaces then as the subordinate conjunction. When I was having dinner last week, I spoke with my friend. In Old English and early Middle English, it would have been then I was having dinner last week, I spoke with my friend. Now, here in the Ozarks, um, people often say whenever instead of when, which is uh, one of my little judgy pet peeves that I have. I'm like, no, whenever refers to a activity that or something that took place um, at random intervals over time. It's not like whenever I was walking to my car on Thursday morning, I ran into my friend who said to me, it drives me crazy. But, you know, I try to be I try to be a descriptivist linguist and be like all forms of speech are beautiful and good. I fail sometimes. Um, more developments in Middle English. Uh, nay is gradually replaced by not. We were talking about that already. Um, not not was a contraction of not of no what, like no thing. Um Fun little th fact here, the phrase willy-nilly, as in whether you like it or not, um, nay would sometimes be compounded in Middle English with verbs that either had a liquid beginning or a vowel beginning. So nay, nay willa is I don't want to, but it would get contracted to ain ik nila, I do not want to. Um, uh, you, you can find a lot of other examples of this. Um, oh, also, is not would, would sometimes in Middle English be said niz. Ne is, and it would be contracted to niz. So niz, N-I-S, is Middle English for isn't. Okay, another thing about negatives in Middle English. Mul, mul, you know how you say, like, um, people when people say, like, well, I don't have no problem with that. And you're like, well, does that mean you do have a problem with it? Because you said two negatives and they cancel each other out. That rule about two negatives canceling each other out comes from the 18th century. And it comes from Latin rules, which were um, formulated under the um, kind of influence of formal logic. In fact, in many languages in the world, Spanish, French, um, and many dialects of English, including uh um, for example, African-American vernacular English and various kinds of Southern English, multiple negatives don't cancel each other out. They reinforce each other. And the fancy linguistics term for this is called negative concord. I actually wrote a whole essay in a journal on negative concord and the medieval poet John Gower. Fun stuff. Um, not one of my most more widely cited essays for some reason. But anyway, um, more developments in Middle English. An increasing use of prepositions for object phrases, for and to, um, for him, to him, at them, whatever. Uh, subjunctives increasingly expressed through modals and infinitives. I said that already in the shift to SVO. I'm kind of repeating myself a little bit here, but these are most of the details about Middle English syntax. I could have gone way into more detail. You're like, really? Yeah, really. Um, all right, so let's just have a look at Middle English syntax in order to get a better sense of it. This is from the uh, mid to late 14th century poem, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight by the anonymous poet who is who's also often known as the Gawain poet or the Pearl poet. Sith in the sage and the assault was seized at Troy, since the siege and the assault were seized at Troy. The borg Britain and brent to brandes and askers, the battlements broken and burnt to brands and ashes. The took that the traumas of treason there brought, the man that the plots of treason there made, was tried for his treachery. What's treed for his treachery? The truest on earth. Now, this, this is poetry, so it's going to have a more elaborate style, and it's going to like kind of build more. But one of the things that you can see that's quite distinct from Old English is lots and lots of definite articles. The siege, the assault, the battlements. 
um, the man, the plot, right? This is not a feature of Old English. You do not get uh, articles before many or most nouns. We also see that subject, object, verb order. Um, the, me the talk that the trams of treason there wrought. The man that the plots of treason there made. Subject, the man. Object, the plots of treason. Verb, there made. Um, we see actually a trichery, which is a nice French word, and we'll talk about that's word formation is for the next video. Hit what's Aeneas the Athol uh, to go on. It was Aeneas the Noble. And notice hit what's it was. And um, we have that dummy subject, that pleonastic subject pronoun that I was telling you about. In Old English, you could have just said was Aeneas the noble. Oh, and notice though that that Athel, that word, um, like which we find in Athelred and Athelkin and, and Athelflath and so many Old English names, uh, is still around in this West Midlands dialect. That's two videos from now. Um, we'll be we'll talk about dialects, but that this is uh, still a word that's around from Old English. And his heakinda, that uh, there's that being used as a relativizer there. It was Aeneas the noble and his high kin that afterwards convinced provinces and masters uh, well nigh of all the wealth in the Western regions. So this is just a little taste of the syntax of Middle English and what distinguishes it from Old English and a little bit of what distinguishes it from the English that will come later uh, in, in early modern English. We will more or less lose subject, object, verb uh, pronouns uh, or subject, object, verb order, except um, in very rare or, or very specific poetic instances where a poet is in doing a, like a, an inversion using their using what's called poetic license, right? Poetic license means you can mess with the grammar. Um, and yeah, so I hope you've enjoyed this video. If, if you've made it this far, you're probably a grammar nerd like me, so good on you. And here's a pretty picture at the end. Um, this is a, a 15th century uh, big panel painting of the siege of Troy. And you can see here that the medieval, the medieval world imagined the ancient world very much in its own terms. They're wearing tights and armor and jerkins and carrying lances and riding horses with stirrups. The walls of Troy have crenellations, which is those, those kind of zigzaggy castle top things. A um, little bit of classical arches and, and statuary going on to indicate this is the ancient world, but you see the peaked roofs of a modern cathedral. Um, and also you see a very Italian style uh, tower uh, that like the Tower of Pisa that's circular with the uh, surrounding arches and the rings on it. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this video. In the next one, we're talking about more about Middle English. I think we're talking about word formation. Uh, so uh, thank you for sticking around. Bye.